Yes, I'm gonna mention it. Yes, this time for sure. Okay. May 11th, 1940. In just some eight months of this war, we've seen that neutrality is no guarantee that you won't be invaded by a hostile power. And that's really on display this week. For this week, four neutral nations are invaded. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese launched the Battle of Zhaoyang Yisheng. The Allies evacuated central Norway, which the Germans were consolidating, and Adolf Hitler made plans for his major Western offensive to begin this week. Here's what followed. On the 5th, a Norwegian government in exile is formed in London. The Germans are still advancing north from Trondheim in Norway, but Allied troops are arriving at Harstad and Tromsø. Just now, it's Poles and the French Foreign Legion. By the 7th, some 5,000 Polish mountain troops have landed at Harstad. So the Allies have over 20,000 men near Narvik, the Germans only around 5,000. Speaking of Narvik, there is a huge debate on the 7th and 8th of May in Britain's House of Commons, a debate known as either the Narvik debate or the Norway debate. Following a motion to adjourn, the debate is mostly about the multiple failures of the British-Norwegian campaign, which we've seen over the past few weeks. It really showcases, though, the general dissatisfaction with Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's government and its conduct of the war and the build-up to war period. It isn't just the opposition that is vocal in its critique, though. There's a lot of heat from Chamberlain's own Conservative Party. What effectively is a motion of no confidence is voted on, and Chamberlain wins that 281 to 200. But this is a lot less than his majority, and more than a quarter of his party either abstains or votes against him. So it's pretty clear that he is no longer really representative of the people's will and is seriously losing support. He cannot reach an agreement with the Labour or Liberal parties who refuse to serve under his leadership, so they can't form an all-party government with him at its head. They are willing to accept another Conservative as Prime Minister, however, and on the 10th, Neville Chamberlain resigns. I sought an audience of the King this evening and tendered to him my resignation, which His Majesty has been pleased to accept. It seems at first that Lord Halifax, now Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, will be the new Prime Minister. Most of both the Conservative majority and Labour minority would support him, but he is a peer, so he also sits in the House of Lords. And this is not ideal for a national leader, though realistically it's just a technical issue. Lord Beaverbrook has this to say. Chamberlain wanted Halifax. Labour wanted Halifax. Sinclair wanted Halifax, the Lords wanted Halifax, the King wanted Halifax, and Halifax wanted Halifax. That's not really true, though. Halifax does not seem to want to become Prime Minister. He apparently thinks Winston Churchill is a better choice than he is, and that he can be more effective as Churchill's deputy. In fact, the errors of the Norwegian campaign have been at least as much Churchill's as any others. However, in a wider sense, the responsibility is Chamberlain's for failing to establish a coherent decision-making structure to see that plans were properly coordinated and that subordinates worked sensibly and efficiently. Churchill visits King George and officially takes office as Prime Minister the 10th. A new government is formed in which all the parties have a place, and Churchill is also Minister of Defense. He is also head of the Special Defense Committee, he and the Chiefs of Staff, to really run the day-to-day -day strategic conduct of the war. Churchill does have some work, however, to do to win the confidence of his own party. There are machinations going on in other nations' leadership as well. On the 8th, Semyon Timoshenko replaces Kliment Voroshilov as the Soviet Union's Commissar for Defense. Soon will come Timoshenko's training programs to teach the Red Army the costly lessons from the Soviet Winter War against Finland. There is more and more tension between French Prime Minister Paul Reynaud and French Army Commander Maurice Gamelon. Reynaud wants him gone, but cannot just dismiss him because he enjoys former Prime Minister Edouard Daladier's support. The quarrel is coming to a head, but it is deferred by the action on the battlefields of Europe, May the 10th, 1940. That's the invasions of those neutral nations I mentioned at the beginning. On May the 10th, 1940, Britain invades and occupies Iceland. What did you think I was gonna say? Anyhow, 
The decision for occupation comes after Iceland repeatedly refuses to abandon neutrality and allow a British military presence there. The British troops that land on Iceland are mostly Royal Marines and mostly just finished with their basic training and they are the advance units of a force that is to set up a destroyer and scout plane base to help the Atlantic shipping convoys and is also to prevent the Germans from using the island. The British quickly take control of Iceland's telecommunications and broadcasting systems. The German consul and several dozen Germans in Reykjavik are arrested. This invasion and the other ones today are done with no warnings nor declarations of war. For the first few days of this week, Operation Falgelb, Plan Yellow, Adolf Hitler's plan to invade France and the three Benelux countries is postponed by bad weather, much as it was last fall. On the morning of the 9th, with favorable weather reports, Hitler sets the following day as the launch date. Hitler's generals study intelligence reports, which partly come from documents captured in Norway that give them the British order of battle, which I went over last week. Decoded French radio messages further their knowledge to the point where they know the Allies' unit-by-unit unit plans and that they have no plans for a counterattack against the flank of a hypothetical German thrust into the Ardennes forest. Hitler leaves Berlin that day, and shortly before dawn on the 10th, his train reaches Euskirchen, a town near the Belgian border. An hour later, his daring and dangerous offensive begins. We've talked about both the Allied and German forces and battle plans over the past two months, and the German attack indeed goes off as planned. Wilhelm von Liebes, Army Group C, is to hold the Franco-German border opposite the French Maginot Line. Gerd von Rundstedt's Army Group A in the center, led by three armored corps in the vanguard, advances into the Ardennes. Paul Kleist has Heinz Guderian and Georg Hans Reinhardt's corps under his command, heading for Sedan and Montaigne. Hermann Hotz makes for Dinan. They advance rapidly against little opposition, which they easily brush aside. Fedor von Bock's Army Group B makes far more spectacular attacks on the right against Belgium and the Netherlands, though. Paratroopers dropping from the sky deep inside Holland beginning at 4.30 a.m. paralyze Dutch resistance. The Dutch are really taken by surprise, having had no part in World War I and having not fought a war on their own European soil since 1830. Half of their 125 planes are destroyed straight away on the ground. They plan to retreat to the defenses of Fortress Holland, the region of waterways near Amsterdam and Rotterdam. But the Germans ruin that plan in hours, flying over and landing the 22nd Airborne Division in its heart. In Belgium, a German airborne force of 78 paratroopers lands atop Fort Eben Emael in gliders, totally surprises the defenders and puts the fortress out of action. This fortress is considered by many to be not only the strongest fortress in the world, but completely impregnable. It is in fact the linchpin of the main Belgian defense line and covers the junction of the River Meuse and the Albert Canal. And the Germans have prepared for this attack far in advance using a full-scale mock-up of the fortress exterior. This is the first time gliders are used in an initial attack and also the first time hollow charges that focus an explosive energy are used in warfare. The fortress will fully surrender the 11th once the paratroopers are reinforced. But now from the start, the German army can invade Belgium without the mighty covering fire of Eben Emael to stop them. Attacks such as this grab British and French attention, and by the evening they have mostly moved to their planned positions on the Dillet line, which I talked about last week. Thing is, the fortifications there do not at all compare with those on the Franco-Belgian border that they've been building up over the winter and spring. And the Belgians have not allowed the French or British army onto Belgian soil before invasion, thinking that would compromise their neutrality and provoke the Germans. So some of the Allied reserve now is used to strengthen the lines. A word here about General Van Overstraten, Belgian King Leopold's main military advisor. He gets a lot of flack for resisting the French and British offers to set up on Belgian soil before the invasion. But John Keegan points out that his objection to close cooperation with them was not just that it would violate Belgium's neutrality, which was what Belgium thought its best defense against invasion in general, but his correct judgment was that they intended to advance no further than the center of the kingdom. 
His equally correct but harsher judgment was that they would allow the Belgian army to sacrifice itself in its forward positions on the Albert Canal while they consolidated their own behind it on the Delit Line. By the end of the day, the German advance has gone pretty much according to plan, and the Allies are doing everything the Germans hoped they would to maximize the German successes. It already looks like the Belgian and Dutch armies will not be able to hold out long enough for British or French help to arrive in time. The third Benelux country is fully occupied by the 11th, and the main thrust of the whole offensive, Rundstedt's armor in the center, has yet to meet any real opposition, nor is the nature of the threat he poses realized. On the 11th, they advance nearer and nearer to the River Meuse. From the beginning, the two sides are overall fairly evenly matched on the ground number-wise, with the defending nation's total divisions outnumbering the Germans 149 to 136, according to David Somerville. The Allies have more tanks, and some of them are better models than the German ones, but very importantly, the Germans have theirs under a single command, in one tactical system, in efficient armored divisions. The French tanks are mostly just used for infantry support and in reserves, and the British don't even have an armored division on mainland Europe. Their incomplete 1st Armored Division is ordered to France on the 11th. The Germans are much stronger in the sky than the Allies, though, outnumbering them 3 to 2 and with superior model planes. Well, this week, a week full of action, comes to an end. And as it does on the 11th in the Caribbean, British and French forces land on Aruba and Curaçao to protect oil installations there, as well as the approach to the Venezuelan oil fields. One after another, the neutral nations of Europe have been attacked. From all sides by now, by the Germans, the Soviets, the British. But of course, it is the German army that is doing the majority of the attacking. They finally attacked France, too, after a state of war has existed between the two for over eight months. But what does this invasion mean? This invasion of four nations at once? Well, I don't know how it's going to play out. But considering the amount of men in the field, and the weaponry, armor, and artillery they will use, I can tell you this. It is going to involve dead bodies in the hundreds of thousands. At least. Adolf Hitler's power is both consolidating and branching out. If you'd like to see his beginnings some 20 years ago, check out our Between Two Wars episode about that right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Angel Garcia Menendez. Thanks to Angel and our other patrons, we are able to provide you with this content. If you have not done so, please support us at timegoes.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.